about how you can make high resolution images without needing a focusing lens or a mirror using laser interferometry. Um, but before I begin, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. First of all, you belong at UVU, whoever you are, there is a place for you here. One of the things I love the most about working at UVU is that uh, inclusion is very important in the mission of UVU. So whoever you are, we're glad you're here, all right? I also wanted to advise you to get involved in research now. If you were here last week, you saw a bunch of introductions to research and saw Alex's presentation today. Um, York's gonna give one in a couple weeks, I guess. There's all this research going on in the department and you should get involved. It's a great opportunity. Now, let me tell you some things that student research is not, just so you don't get the wrong idea. Student research is not a job. I don't know, I had students who are like, oh, they're offering a dollar more an hour if I go and work at the pharmacy, you know, sweeping up or something. Well, student research is not really a job. A lot of people do it as a volunteer. Some people do it for class credit. And when possible, we try and find money for you because we know that if you can get money to do research, you don't have to work as many hours somewhere else and you'll have more time to put in to research. But it's not a job. And student research is not stress free. Student research is a lot of fun most of the time, but you're going to be solving hard problems and sometimes that's going to be stressful. Sometimes you're going to be meeting deadlines. You're going to be doing things you've never done before and learning how to do them. But this is what student research is. It's an opportunity to find out what you like to do. So rather than, you know, majoring in physics and being like, I bet I'm going to love doing this. And then I'm going out and, you know, getting a job or going to graduate school and be like, you know, I actually don't enjoy this. That's, that's kind of a late point in your career to figure that out. So this is a chance to see, do you like doing physics research? Maybe you enjoy doing experimental work, but maybe you don't. And so then you go and you start working with someone who does computational or theoretical. It's a chance to find out what you like to do. And it's a chance to find out what you can do. You know, you most of you've never done any of these kinds of things before. And so you may be feeling like, huh, I don't know if I can do that or not. That is not a reason to not get involved in research. That's a reason to get involved in research so you can see what you're capable of doing. You'll probably surprise yourself at what you're able to learn and do. It's an opportunity to gain rare and extremely valuable experience. The kinds of things you will learn doing undergraduate research are things that are hard to learn anywhere else. And when you apply to a job or apply to graduate school, you're going to have these experiences and these abilities that other people who didn't do undergraduate research won't have. It's going to make you valuable. Um, it's an opportunity to work closely with a faculty member. Having a faculty member that you know really well and a faculty member who knows how you work really well, it's important. For one thing, the faculty member is going to pass on things that they have learned. Things questions you didn't even know you had about how to prepare for your career, how to prepare for graduate school, how to get into graduate school, how to find fellowships for graduate school, how to approach an experiment scientifically, all kinds of things, questions you didn't even know you had will be answered. And then when you go to apply for a job or apply to graduate school, you're going to need to get recommendation letters. And a recommendation letter from your neighbor that says they seem like a decent person you know, they keep their yard up nice, is <laughs> not a very strong recommendation. A recommendation from a faculty member who can say specific things about the work that you did, problems you solved, hurdles you overcame, those are strong research, uh, strong recommendation letters, which will help you get in, get your the job you want, get into the graduate school that you want. And also, undergraduate research is an opportunity to present scientific results. So hopefully you work long enough with someone that you do something significant. You get some significant results and then you get the opportunity to present them, to go to a conference and do a presentation or to write a proceedings paper or a peer reviewed publication. And you'll get the first hand experience learning how scientists communicate science. OK, so now I'll get off my soapbox and talk about my research. I research something that we call IPSI or Interference Pattern Structured Illumination Imaging. So let me tell you what IPSI is. IPSI is a lensless and single detector imaging technique which uses laser interference patterns to take high resolution images of an object 
potentially from long distances from the object. Okay, to understand why that would be a useful thing to be able to do, let's talk about some of the limits of conventional imaging. So the idea with conventional imaging is you have a something you want to make an image of, right? And for each point on that object, light comes out and is scattered in different directions. And then you have a lens or a mirror that takes all the light going from one point and redirects it to a point on the imaging plane, right? And then you can take your image. So you have all these different points. So the light for each point is redirected by the lens to a specific point on the image plane. Well, there's some problems. First of all, light is a wave. It diffracts. So even if my light's coming from a really, 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 really tiny point on the one side, on the image plane, it's not going to come to an infinitesimal point. It's going to come to a diffraction limited point, even if my lens is perfect. If my lens is perfect, there will be a little bit of blur in my image because of diffraction. Okay. Well, what if my lens isn't perfect? What if it's not an ideal lens? What if it's a real lens that I paid for with my limited budget? Well, then my lens is going to have additional errors on top of you know, the blurry you get from an ideal lens. So here's my aberration, things get even worse. Well, it turns out usually aberrations are easier to control if you have a smaller diameter lens, or if I put an aperture that blocks all of my lens except the middle part, okay? But when you make your lens smaller to get rid of aberrations, it turns out the smaller your lens, the more diffraction you get, okay? So by aperturing down my lens, I may have reduced aberrations, but I've made this kind of diffraction blurring bigger. And there's this thing we call the Abe diffraction limit that tells you how well you can resolve things with a lens or a mirror. And it's related, if, you've, if you're familiar with Rayleigh's criterion, Rayleigh's criterion is like the limit for far field uh, imaging with the Abe limit. And the Abe limit says the smallest feature you can resolve, D, is the wavelength divided by two times the index of refraction times the sine of the angle of the light you catch. It's that angle right there from the middle out to the edge. And the index of refraction times the sine of theta is known as the numerical aperture. So if you want to do high resolution imaging, you have to not have aberrations and have a big numerical aperture. You need to capture a big angle of light so that the diffraction limited spot is small. So for example, here I've got two points. Hopefully you can see this okay. I've got a little red dot and a little blue dot. And they each emit light, and then the lens focuses their light down. But because of diffraction, the image of those two, they're overlapping. They're not well resolved. But if I use a bigger lens with a larger numerical aperture, the diffraction spots get smaller, and now they're resolved. Okay? So the takeaway from this is for high resolution imaging, you need large numerical aperture optics, ones that capture a big angle of light. And that's a problem because they tend to be expensive. Okay, so here is an example of a high numerical aperture microscope objective. So this is a microscope objective you can buy on Thor Labs. This is just one compound lens, one single microscope objective. And look at the cost here, let's zoom in. $29,495 for a visible light microscope objective. Okay, all right. Another problem is when you have high resolution optics, they tend to have a small field of view. What does that mean? It means you can only image a small area. So typically when you design lenses to try and get rid of these aberrations so you can do high numerical aperture imaging, you get really nice resolution near the middle, you know, right near the axis of your lens. But as you move off axis, suddenly you get terrible aberrations. So basically you design so that you have low aberrations in the middle, but you have to pay for that by having horrible aberrations on the edge. Uh, that's usually the compromise you have to make. So that means you can only image effectively over a small area. So to go to high resolution, I need expensive large numerical aperture lenses and my field of view gets small. OK. Also, for large numerical aperture imaging, you have a small working distance. What's the working distance? That's the distance from the stuff you're imaging to your lens. And the bigger your lens is, 
more expensive it gets, the harder it is to get rid of aberrations. So generally, rather than making your lens big to get a high numerical aperture, you'll make a small lens and put it really close, right? Small lens with a short focal length and put it really close to what you're imaging. That's why most microscopes, the objective is just like right up against the thing you're imaging. But sometimes you want a longer working distance. You know, maybe you're trying to image something through a vacuum window inside of a vacuum and you just can't get close to it. OK, or maybe the thing you're imaging is really hot and you can't get your lens too close to it. All right. Well, that makes it really hard because if you want to have high resolution, you need large numerical aperture. And if you're going to be a long distance away, that means you need a really big lens. Really big lenses are hard to make. They're expensive. They tend to have lots of aberrations. It's just not going to work out. Also, for conventional imaging, you need a multi pixel detector. Right, we project this image onto a detector and the detector has to have different pixels to tell, you know, there's a lot of light here. There's not a lot of light here and so forth. Well, high numerical aperture optics and multi pixel detectors are sometimes hard to find expensive or don't work very well, depending on what type of waves you're using. For example, X rays, quantum matter waves, sound waves, radar. It can be quite complicated to get all the elements you need to do conventional imaging. So if we could get rid of a multi pixel detector and just have a single detector that's detected however much light or whatever X rays or quantum waves hit it, you know, and just optimize the heck out of that one pixel. And if we can avoid having high numerical aperture optics, then maybe we could do imaging better with these different types of waves. Also, the depth of field. So the field of view is how big of an area you can see. The depth of field is how deep of an image you can make. Because as things move away from the lens or closer to the lens, they're going to get out of focus, right? So imagine I have my device set up so that the red dot makes a nice diffraction limited focus on my screen. The blue dot is a little closer to the lens, which means its image forms further back and it's going to be out of focus on my detector, right? Well, it turns out you can make your depth of field bigger so that things don't blur as quickly as you move out of focus by making your lens smaller, by going to a lower F or a lower, a lower numerical aperture. But when you do that, you also increase the diffraction spot size. So there's kind of this dilemma that going to higher resolution implicitly means going to a smaller depth of field. So it would be great if we could get away from high numerical aperture optics, away from multi pixel detectors. But how do you do that? How do you get an image without an imaging lens or mirror and using a single pixel detector? And the answer is something called structured illumination. You don't just illuminate with light everywhere. You illuminate with patterns of light. One example of structured illumination is LIDAR. And some of you may be familiar with LIDAR. LIDAR is like being investigated intensely right now because people think it would be a great way for self-driving cars to get a picture of what's around them. But the basic idea with LiDAR is I shine a laser beam onto something and then I look and see how much light scatters off of that object or transmits through the object. Now I don't need a lens to make an image to figure out how bright that spot is. I just collect, get a photo detector and collect whatever light comes out. And the amount of light that hits my detector tells me how bright that spot is. And then I can move to another spot and see how much light reflects from there. OK, and then you just like raster your laser beam over the object and measure how much light scatters from each point and you get an image. But notice this image is kind of pixelated. What determines the resolution you get with LiDAR? Depends on how big your laser beam is, right? OK, now. You can do other patterns as well. Instead of one pixel at a time, you can do like stripes or random dots or whatever. But the point is, if you can figure out, if you measure how much light scatters from a whole bunch of different patterns, and you know what the patterns are, you can figure out what the object was that was scattering the light, okay? So now we have a way to make an image with a single pixel detector. We don't have to have a multi-pixel detector, right? Instead of multiple pixels, we have multiple patterns that we project. However, the resolution is still limited by a focusing lens or mirror, right? We've got to project that pattern onto the object. The resolution of LiDAR depends on how tightly we can focus our laser. What determines how tightly our laser focuses? The numerical aperture of the lens that's focusing the laser. 
So if I want to have a really high resolution LIDAR image, I need to fill a big lens with laser light and have it focused to a point. And that lens needs to be, you know, aberration free, diffraction limited for that high numerical aperture. OK, so we've got a single pixel detector, but we're still limited by the focus and lens or mirror. If I'm going to project other patterns, I need a lens to project those patterns. And those patterns are going to be fuzzy because conventional optics have a limit. So how do I get around that? Well, IPSI is how we get around that. IPSI stands for Interference Pattern Structured Illumination Imaging. So the basic idea is fine patterns are generated using interferometry. So instead of using a lens to project some pattern, we're just going to let two laser beams come together and interfere and make tiny patterns, which can then give us high resolution information about our image. OK, so here's the basic layout for our IPSI interferometer. Over here on the left, I have a green laser beam, and it's striking a beam splitter. A beam splitter is a device that will reflect some of the laser light, but let some of the laser light go through. So let's look at the beam that goes through. It's going to go down, reflect off of a mirror, off another mirror, off another mirror, off another mirror, and then hit another beam splitter. When it hits this beam splitter, some of that light, whoops, is going to go to the object we're imaging. Some of it goes to a reference pinhole, but we'll talk about laser later. All right, now let's look at the, the beam that reflected off this beam splitter. It hits this mirror, this mirror, this mirror, this mirror, and then hits this beam splitter. And some of that light goes to the object you're imaging. Some of it goes to our reference bin hole. All right, so if you put them together, now I have two different beams that are hitting the object I'm imaging. Now let's imagine that these two beams, they're plane waves. I'm going to plot it here. These are lines that represent the wave fronts on my wave. They're the places where the electric field is at its largest positive value okay so there's one wave and here's the other and we're just going to add them together now depending on the path lengths of the two the two paths that go and combine right the laser can go one way or the other these two sets of wave fronts they can be out of phase like this such that the peak of one is where the valley of another one is and the waves cancel out and give us nothing or they could be right on top of each other and make us big waves or anywhere in between. Yes, Paul. Alan, you had the laser light kind of doing the, um, yes, way on the left, you've got it going kind of backwards. Is that so you can control optical oh, path length with those? Elements? It It is, actually. It turns out that with this, we can, uh, by having this extra reflection, there's a nice way where we can like tune the lengths of the two paths to try and balance them the best that we can. All right. And if the paths are perfectly balanced, then these two beams will be right on top. The wavefronts will be right on top of each other. We get a bright beam or they can be, you know, 180 degrees out of phase where they cancel each other out. And we can actually control that because this mirror over here, you see these red knobs here, those represent piezoelectric actuators that can move that mirror back and forth a tiny bit to change the length of one of the paths while leaving the other path the same. And you can actually then use that to scan the phase of the two beams to make the light bright or dark, okay? But now to generate different patterns, what we can do is we can use these blue actuators, those represent motors on our mirror mounts, to change the angles of these two beams. So if the beams are coming you know, parallel, we get the picture we saw before, but if the beams are at a slight angle to each other, there are places in space where they're in phase with each other. Whoops, it's getting ahead of me here. Where they're in phase with each other and you get a bright bit of light. Places where they're out of phase and you get no light. All right, and in between, the light gets brighter and darker in space. And so these are what we call fringes. Here's a bright fringe, a dark fringe, a bright fringe. And as I scan the phase of one of the paths relative to the other, these fringes move. So the phase of the interference pattern tells me how the fringes move, All right? If I go to a steeper angle, I get fringes that are closer together, go to an even steeper angle, and I get fringes that are even closer to each other, okay? So here's just a little mathematical. I added two waves traveling together at an angle, and you see where the two beams intersect, they make these interference fringes. And the spacing between the interference fringes depends on the angle between the beams. As we go to a bigger angle, the fringes get smaller. 
So bigger angle means smaller fringes, it means I can detect finer things in my image. In fact, if you go to the maximum angle you use while taking your Ipsy image, you can use that angle to define an effective numerical aperture of Ipsy imaging, just like the numerical aperture of a lens. OK. All right, so here's a picture of one of the interferometers in action. We've got a blue laser and a green laser, and they're combined, and then they actually go into the interferometer part. Here's the actual interferometer part here. Here's our first beam splitter and our light hits that beam splitter. Some of it goes through and hits this mirror. Then it hits the mirror mounted on a piezo stack that we can move back and forth. Then it bounces off of two motorized mirrors, hits the second beam splitter and goes to the object we're imaging. The light that reflects off of the first beam splitter goes to this mirror, this mirror, this motorized mirror, this motorized mirror, through the beam splitter and also hits the object we're trying to image, okay? And these are actual pictures of some of the interference patterns we've made. Just put a white card right there and took a picture with a camera of these interference patterns. And by changing the angles of the beams, uh, we can change the spacing and orientation of these interference fringes. Okay, so to understand how we can take the data we get from these different patterns and then turn it into an image of the object, I just want to do like a little sort of mathematically somewhat almost not quite rigorous model here. All right, but to simplify things, I'm going to do it in one dimension. So instead of saying, hey, we're looking at this object and seeing how much light transmits through in two dimensions, I'm just going to make a function. So imagine I have an object. It's a one dimensional object. And as a function of X, the transmission changes. So right here, the transmission is 100%. All the light comes through. Right here, it's 50%. So whatever light hits here, half of that will get through. And these spots down here is zero transmission. None of the light gets through there, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this pattern, this object, and I'm gonna illuminate it with different patterns. The first pattern, I'm gonna call it the zeroth pattern actually, is just light everywhere, no fringes, okay? So here I have light everywhere, and then here's light everywhere, and then here's the transmission profile of our object. So what does the light look like after it's gone through the object? We multiply the two together and we get this. And then our detector just measures the total amount of light getting through, right? And so we just add up, we basically integrate this, the area under the curve, and we get this number right here that I'm calling A0. Okay, next we're going to make some very large fringes, all right? So it's not just light everywhere, it's a fringe that changes in space, but it's a very long one. I take that light pattern multiplied by my object, and this is the light that comes through. But my detector just detects the total amount of light, so I integrate that, and I get this thing here that I'm calling A1. Before we go to an even finer fringe spacing, I'm going to take the same fringe spacing, but shift it over 90 degrees in phase. That will give me another pattern. So I move it over 90 degrees, multiply by my object, and I get this, I integrate, and I get the value which I'm calling B1. So we have like pattern one, but it's got like it's A and it's B position. And then we can go to pattern two, where the fringes are twice as close together. We get our A and our B. And then we can go and do fringes that are even closer together, you know, going up, you know, three times as close together as, as one, four times. So here's four times as close together. Here is eight times as close together. Right, and we just do the same thing. We illuminate with these patterns, do a 90 degree shift, and we measure kind of the total light coming through each pattern. And we can actually plot the numbers we get. It's kind of like a spectrum, okay? So the red line shows all of the A coefficients and the blue one shows the B coefficients, and we can represent all the numbers we measure on a graph. Well, we don't want a graph like this necessarily. What we wanted was an image, right? So I'm going to take this data and I'm going to add things together uh, based on this data. So I start by adding with just A0, that's just a constant. And then I'm going to add in something that's related to my A1 measurement times a cosine. Then I'm going to add in something related to my B1 measurement times a sine. Then I'm going to add in something related to my A2, my B2, and so forth. And as I add more and more terms, what I get starts to look like the thing that I'm imaging. So here I'm adding uh, A0 plus 30 A terms times a cosine plus 30 B terms times a sine. Here's 40, 
is 63. Okay, and I get exactly my object back. Now, if you're familiar with Fourier transforms, you'll notice this looks an awful lot like a Fourier transform. And in fact, from these A and B coefficients, we can actually calculate the Fourier coefficients of our image. So that's usually what we do. We, we don't stop with these. We actually calculate this thing right there, and then we just have the Fourier representation of our object, and we do an inverse Fourier transform, and we get our image, okay? All right, and in fact, so I can, I can take my A and B coefficients and get the Fourier coefficients, so here's an actual Fourier spectrum for that object. Okay, now to do this in two dimensions, of course, in addition to having different fringe spacings, we also need to have different orientations of our fringes for our different patterns, okay? And so here's just kind of a potpourri of fringes. And here's an example of an actual image we took doing this. This is an image we took of an Air Force test resolution target. This one, uh, the pixel size is 24 microns and the blurring is sub-pixel. So what that means is the resolution of this image is exactly as good as our theory says it should be. All right, then we zoomed in and took an image of this pixel size of 60 microns, zoomed in, took a picture of that pixel size of 4.5 microns and still the blurring is sub pixel scale. So what does that tell us? Our, we're imaging as good as our theory says we should if we could set up a, a setup where we went to even higher numerical aperture, we should be able to get higher resolution. And here is like our highest resolution image. Um, I think the pixel size here was just over two microns. And again, the, the blurring is sub pixel, which means it's exactly following our theory of what our resolution should be. Okay, now we talked about working distance. So within conventional imaging, higher resolution means short working distance, but not necessarily with IPSI, all right? And so when we put together our first interferometer, we weren't trying to optimize anything. We just wanted to get an image and see if it worked. Then afterwards, we went back and we said, wow, this distance here was about 10 centimeters. That's really big for a microscope. And if you look at long working distance microscopes that you can buy commercially, spend thousands and thousands of dollars to get a long working distance microscope with a working distance of about 10 centimeters, our resolution beats all the commercial stuff. And like I say, we weren't even trying to optimize for that. It was just something we did. It's just our initial setup. OK, now to get our different coefficients, remember for each fringe spacing, we have to get a, a, a value with the fringe centered and with the fringe moved over 90 degrees. So how can we do that? Well, one way you could do it is, well, controlling the optical phase of an interferometer is hard because if anything moves by a fraction of an optical wavelength, what is the wavelength of visible light? about half a micron, about 500 nanometers. It's really small. And if anything jiggles by that much, it's going to mess up the phase of your interferometer. So what you can do is that's where this reference pinhole comes in over here. We have an interference pattern on our object. We also have one over here that hits a little pinhole. And you can move the piezos here to move your interference pattern to a point where the pinhole sees a maximum of light. There's your A coefficient. Then you move it till it's halfway to zero, and that's your B coefficient. But it turns out that's hard, harder than it has to be, okay? Because you have to kind of get it there, know you're there, and hold it there while you make a measurement. So we use an easier technique where what we do is we just ramp the phase. We just scan the piezos and let the fringes pass by. And it turns out when you do that, your, you know, your Fourier coefficients, A that goes with cosine and B that goes with sine. You can also think of that as a single sine wave with an amplitude C and a phase shift phi. And you can get that amplitude just from how much your signal oscillates as you ramp the phase, right? And the blue line represents the signal coming from our object. And the red one represents the signal coming through the pinhole. And by looking at the distance between the peaks between the signal and the pinhole, you can get the phase shift. All right. So rather than trying to like lock the phase somewhere, we just ramp it and do this. And in fact, it's even easier than that. It's not like we have to curve fit to find where our science peaks are and things. We actually use what's known as locking detection. We just take the signal from our 
image from our object, the signal from our reference pinhole, multiply them together and integrate them and you get something proportional to B2. OK, that or, or to B. In this case, it was the second interference pattern. How do you find A? Well, you just need to do the same thing, but instead of multiplying by a sine wave, you multiply by a cosine. In other words, I take my signal from the pinhole and I shift it 90 degrees. So you can use something called a Hilbert transform to take a signal and shift it by 90 degrees. And so we do that, multiply the two together and average them and we get our A coefficient. And the great thing about lock in detection is if there's any noise in your signal or in your pinhole, the noise that's not correlated between both of them averages away. So you're not subject to the noise. That you're only subject to the noise which is common to both your image, your, your object uh, detector and your pinhole detector. Now we can do multispectral imaging just like any microscope would, right? How do you how do you make a color image with a microscope? We well, hook a color camera up to it, right? And the color camera has filters that make sure that some light goes to some pixels, you know, red light goes to some pixels, blue light goes to other pixels, and so forth. Well, we can do the same thing. We can combine multiple laser beams, and then when we go to detect the light, we can put in different filters and send some light to one detector, some to the other. Well, it turns out we don't put any filters on the object, only on the reference pinhole. Okay, so when we take our data, we have two different reference pinhole signals, you know, one for the green light, one for the blue light. But our object data, we don't worry about filtering it. It's just this crazy thing. It's like two sine waves added together. OK, but remember when we use lock in detection, parts that aren't correlated between the two signals average away. So when I multiply by the green lasers reference signal, I multiply that by what I got from my object and average the fluctuations due to the blue laser fringes average to zero and I just get my coefficient for the green light. And when I multiply by my blue reference signal and average, the green signal disappears and I just get my blue signal. So we only have to put filters in one of the detectors, not the other. OK, and so here's some exa here's an example of an image we took simultaneously at 408 nanometers and at 532 nanometers. Notice the image is bigger over here. When you image with, with a shorter wavelength, you get higher resolution. OK, advantages of IPSI. There's no high numerical aperture lens or mirror needed. No need for optics close to the object. The depth of field and the field of view are independent of your resolution. There's no complicated optics. You use a single pixel detector, so that would make it great. Hopefully someday we'll be able to apply this to X-rays, maybe even matter waves, radar, far infrared. We've done a little bit of work with acoustic imaging. And higher resolution, right? Because if, if I don't need a high numerical aperture lens, I just need to scan laser beams out to a big angle. You might imagine it's pretty easy to get to high numerical apertures. Well, not as easy as you might think, but it can be done. But even better, if you work through the theory of IPSI imaging, for a given numerical aperture, the resolution you get is not the Abe limit, but the Abe limit divided by two. So for the same effective numerical aperture, we get twice the resolution. Another cool thing about IPSI is it's very similar to how magnetic resonance imaging is done. When you take an MRI image, you put a magnetic field gradient across the thing you're imaging, which makes different slices of the object come into resonance with the driving waves. And so basically you have a sinusoidally modulated light that's illuminating, you know, microwaves that are illuminating your object. And so we have been able to steal techniques that have been de developed for MRI and use them in our imaging. And cool things we come up with could potentially then be applied back to MRI imaging. So we are short on time, so I just want to quickly talk about some current things we're working on. Um, I have a student who's been working this summer just testing lasers. He's built a little Michelson Worley interferometer where he can change the relative arm lengths and things like that. And then we have a little detector where we can detect light at the middle here of our fringe pattern, scan the fringes, and see if we get good sine waves. Some lasers will not make good interference patterns. Some lasers will make good interference patterns, but then the phase will jump as the laser mode hops. 
And so, as I mentioned, we have a variety of lasers, some that are expensive, some that are cheap. We want to know which ones are good for interferometry. OK. Um, another student uh, that used to I have a student who used to work for me and then he graduated and he's a graduate school, but he finished some really cool work. And so we've been working on finishing up a paper, which I think we finally have the final draft and hopefully we'll submit it this week. But his work is based on something called coherent diffraction imaging. This is a way of imaging that's really popular with X-ray people, right? X-ray lenses are hard to make. So what they do is they just shine a laser beam through the thing they want to image, OK? And so you take the thing you want to image, you shine your coherent beam through it, X-rays, or in our case, a laser beam, right? And it makes a diffraction pattern. The light diffracts, and a long ways away, you get this pattern. Well, this diffraction pattern is just the Fourier transform of the stuff it went through. So in theory, if you can measure this diffraction pattern, you do the inverse transform, you get your object. Well, here's the problem. Standard detectors only detect the amplitude of the diffraction pattern, not the phase. And most of the useful information is in the phase, okay? But the way these uh, X-ray imaging people get around this is they pick their object and they make sure that there are places which are blanked out where no X-rays can get through. And then they say, well, look, when I get my image, I know I should get something which is black outside of this area. So they'll measure the diffraction pattern. They don't know what the phases are. What they'll do is they'll assign random phases, take the inverse transform and say, that's the image I get. And it looks nothing like a chicken. But then they say, well, I know it's supposed to be black out here. So let's make it black out here and then take the inverse transform. And once you take the inverse transform, the hope is the phases are closer to the correct ones, the ones you started with. So you take your original Fourier transform, but change the phases to what you got with this, and you do it over and over again in a cycle. So you take your original pattern, assign a random phase, do an inverse transform to get your image, you apply the mask, then you take the Fourier transform of that, then you keep the phases, but change the amplitudes to what they were originally, take the inverse transform, and there's you know, your n plus one image, and you keep doing that over and over again. And sometimes it will converge. And if it doesn't, there's some tricks you can use to try and help it converge. Well, we thought, well, look, with IPC, we measure in Fourier space, but we don't just measure the amplitude, we measure the phase. But there are errors in our measurements. For example, the main one we found is that our motorized mirror mounts aren't perfect. So they don't go to exactly the angle we wanted them to. And so that gives us errors in our measurements. And we thought, well, what if instead of starting with no phase information, what if we start with pretty good phase information, throw it into the cycle and see if it gets better? And in fact, it worked. So we started with the image on the left and you can see there's ghosting, right? There's a number four, but there's kind of an echo of number four here. Here's three, there's an echo of three and so forth. We ran these phase construction algorithms and we got the image on the right where we've been able to clean the ghosting up for the most part. So it's helpful. Uh, I have another student who graduated from UVU a while ago, but he, he did some first proof of principle stuff, but he's, he thought this is too cool. I'm not going to stop right now. So he's been working with me remotely. He's been doing the theory, the numerical calculations. Well, I've been trying to get the parts that he put together actually implemented into our interferometer. But it turns out that our IPSI images are really slow. It takes us about a day to get that image that I showed you, the Air Force test pattern. And there's two main limitations. One, it takes time to move the mirrors to the different angles, all right? And then it takes time to scan the phase. Scanning with the piezo, you can only scan so fast before your mount starts to resonate and so forth. And so the first thing he worked on was a way to scan the phase quickly. And what we came up with was using a device called an acousto-optic modulator. So here's our setup. And right now we scan the phase by moving these piezos, right? Well, what we want to do is replace the piezo mirror with an acousto-optic modulator, or AOM. An acousto-optic modulator can take a laser beam and shift its frequency. So shift in frequency is the same as a phase scan. So imagine we have one of our laser beams and it's oscillating, you know, sine of omega t. The other one we want it to oscillate, but with a phase shift that we can control. Well, how do we control it? We want to ramp it linearly in time. 
Well, instead of doing that, let's just take that laser beam and shift its frequency. So now its frequency is not omega, it's omega plus delta omega. You distribute out the parentheses and you get sine of omega t plus delta omega times t. It's the same equation, right? So this delta omega, that's just the rate at which we scan the phase. And it turns out instead of taking about a second to scan the phase, acoustic optic modulators oscillate typically for about 50 to 500 megahertz. So instead of taking a second, it's going to take a fraction of a microsecond to scan the phase. Now, right now, the way we set this up is we have a photo detector that detects a signal from the object and one that detects it from the pinhole. We read those into a computer. In the computer, we multiply the object and the reference signal and average get the real part. Then we use a Hilbert transform, multiply together, average get the imaginary part. Now we're going to have oscillations that are going to be a lot faster. And it turns out when you get up into tens or hundreds of megahertz, there's some nice little analog devices you can do use called mixers to multiply signals. So instead of taking this whole data stream of an oscillating signal, we're just going to take the signal from the detect object detector, from the reference detector, and multiply them together with a mixer and send that to the computer. Then we'll take those two signals and we'll have one of them go through a length of coaxial cable so that it gets phase shifted by 90 degrees multiply those together, and that gets us our other signal. So now the computer will directly be reading in these Fourier coefficients without any computation needed. The other thing we're working on is parallel imaging. I'm going to have to go through this really fast. Um, but the idea with parallel imaging is we can get a good image without using as many angles so that we don't have to uh, move the mirrors as many times. And kind of to explain that, imagine I have some function and I take a discrete Fourier transform, I get this, I take the inverse transform and I get the same thing back. Well, let's say I don't want to take as many data points. Let's just take the lower spatial frequency points. What's that going to do to my image? I've low pass filtered it. So now instead of getting the black line, I get the blue one. All right, so we've lost resolution. The resolution is the smallest feature you can see, and it's related to, it's determined by the largest spatial frequency in your Fourier series. So if we cut out the high frequency terms, we lose resolution. So let's not get rid of the high frequency terms. Let's just make our data points spaced further apart. What happens then? Well, to understand that, you need to know what aliasing is. Who knows what aliasing is? It's what you see when you see a strobe lamp, right? You have a strobe light, you put it on a fan, and it looks like the fan's moving slowly. Imagine I have a sine wave, and I try and sample it with a detector. But let's say my detector is not quite fast enough to sample the sine wave. So instead, I sample at these points here, and it looks like I'm measuring a sine wave at a lower frequency than the actual sine wave. We call that aliasing. Well, it turns out you can get aliasing in Fourier space as well. And the way to think about that is you say, well, look, if I take this object and take its Fourier transform. Then I take the inverse transform, I get the object back, right? But what if I plot out further? So instead of going from negative 0.25 to 0.25, what if I plot like from minus one to one? Well, when I take my inverse transform and plot it, the object repeats, right? Because a discrete Fourier transform, all of the terms repeat. And so I get my object over and over again. So now, uh, anyway, if I want to consider resolution, the sharpness of features, my resolution depends on the highest spatial frequency and the field of view, the distance you can plot before it starts to repeat, that is determined by the lowest non-zero spatial frequency, or in other words, the spacing between spatial frequencies. That's why sometimes we call Fourier space reciprocal space, because small things in space are big spatial frequencies in Fourier space. The field of view, the big thing, relates to the smallest features in our uh, Fourier space. So if I get rid of every other point, I've reduced my field of view by two. So right, so when I plot my object, instead of getting the black line that I'm supposed to get, I get this blue line, which repeats. Because it's as if I took the Fourier transform of a smaller set of data, okay? And that's fine if I have an object with lots of black space around it. But what if I had an object that had some features over here and I cared about them? When I take my data, if I make my steps in Fourier space too big, right, I 
Right? So if I take the Fourier transform of this, I get this to the inverse transform, I get it back. If I get rid of every other point, if I make my steps in Fourier space too big, now what I get back is this. It's as if I took the Fourier transform of this, Fourier transform of this, Fourier transform of this, and stuck them all on top of each other. And this is what we call aliasing in Fourier space. So how do you get around aliasing? I want to take fewer points, but still not have this aliasing. If I take my chicken, Titania, but I only take my points at a spacing twice as far apart as I should have, when I do my inverse transform, I get this ghosting. So the head's right here, but it's also here, right? It gets ghosted on top of itself. So the idea with parallel imaging in MRI is instead of using one coil to detect signal from the whole object, you have a bunch of little coils that detect just the things close to them. So imagine, if you will, I had a detector that only detected this corner. I take my data, but I take my data, my spacing in Fourier space is larger than it should be. As a result, when I do my inverse transform, I get all this ghosting. But I know that my detector is only detecting that corner, so I just throw that stuff away. I have another detector that detects only this corner. I get my ghosting, but then I say, look, I know this detector is only detecting and we're there, so I throw that stuff away and so forth. The detector down here, I get ghosting, I throw stuff away. And then when I take the data that I get from each of my detectors and put them together, I get a nice image without this alias, okay? So in our setup, the way we want to do this is instead of having detectors that detect at different parts of our object, we want to replace this mirror with a micro mirror array. Right, it's basically a device that's reflective that has like little pixels where you can turn reflectivity on and off at different points. So then we can have light that only hits certain parts of our object. Okay, now, um, so because this object is far away, we're going to get diffraction. Maybe we want to put a lens in and try and image this pattern onto our object. Well, if we do that, the imaging is only going to be as good as our lens, right? But that doesn't matter because these spots that we're illuminating don't determine our resolution. The fringes in those spots made by interfering with the other beam determine the resolution, okay? And so there's this cool thing that the MRI people use called DRAPA, Generalized Auto Calibrating Partial Parallel Acquisition. And the way that it works is this, is you take your data, but you want to not take as many data points. So I'm gonna leave some of them out. But here at low spatial frequency, I'm actually going to take all my data points. That way, the grapper routine can use the low frequency data and say, oh, for this detector, I know which part is being illuminated. Now I can use this undersampled data and get an image, but I know all this ghosting over here is garbage because I wasn't illuminating. That detector wasn't illuminated over there. Okay. And then you just run it through and you can get your image back. So my student, uh, Daniel Gray, any of you knew Daniel Gray? Uh, graduated like a year and a half ago. He's been doing simulations of this and they're working. So now I have to catch up and get this all implemented into our interferometer so it'll work. Anyway, if you're interested in working with the group, we have lots of future stuff we wanna do. We have some cool robotic arms that I'd like to use to you know, mount laser fiber launchers on them so we can go to bigger angles, upgrading our motorized mounts, different ways of taking data so that we can get better signal to noise. It may be possible to do digital holography with this, measuring the wave front of a wave rather than an object. We've done some preliminary work with acoustic imaging. I have a friend at BYU who does X-ray imaging. Uh, it would be nice if we could figure out how to apply Ipsy to what he's doing. Um, but anyway, Ipsy is really cool. Gives you some things that conventional imaging doesn't. And I'd just like to end with acknowledging the people I've worked with both at BYU and here at UVU. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for hanging in there. It's, we yes, sir, late. I went over a little time there. It wasn't your fault. We started late. Maybe uh -huh. have some question or two that I'd like to ask before we go. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, you mentioned that with optical modulator, you can take image uh, very quickly. How quick? Well, so the okay. Information about it. So we have two problems. One is generating the different patterns. Mm -hmm. And so we're hoping that we can do, you know, if we could do 16 different patterns for a given angle, 
we only have to move to one sixteenth of the of the locations, right? So that, yeah. And then when it comes, so so kind of one sixteenth of the time it takes to move, and about half the time we spend right now is moving, and the other half is scanning. With the AOM, it's like millions of times faster. So with the AOM, the scanning time becomes negligible, and we're just limited by the mirror motion. And if we can do, say, like 16 different discernible patterns with our uh, light modulator, that would mean we're going to cut our data taking in half for the phase and then divide it by that by 16 um, from the different patterns. So on the order of like less than an hour for an image instead of a day. What is the acoustic option? Acousto-optic modulator have in it is like a wave plate. That oh, it's, that it's interesting. So an acousto-optic modulator is a Bragg grating. You guys know what a Bragg grating is? You know what a diffraction grating is, right? And if you, where you have these different points, you shine light in it, scatters off the points, and there are certain directions where you get constructive and destructive interference. If you take those points and turn them into planes, now you have a Bragg reflector. It's the same condition that you have to, only certain angles will give you constructive interference, but now you have to consider constructive interference from light that reflects off of different parts of the plane, right? So it's like a mirror. So you only get light out at the same angle as you come in, right? But then you also have to meet the interference. So you don't get any diffracted light unless you hit the Bragg angle just right, okay? So then you send your light in and you get a diffracted beam. Well, in an acousto-optic modulator, it's a Bragg grating, but it's made with a little crystal that has a little piezo element on it that vibrates. So the Bragg planes are acoustic waves in the crystal. You're, you're reflecting off of little density fluctuations in the crystal. And because they're moving, you're diffracting, but the phase of the diffracted light changes by two pi every time one plane turns into another. Or another way you can think about it is you're reflecting light off of a moving mirror, right? Baseball comes in, you hit it with a bat, it comes out faster than it came in, right? So you can give energy or you can diffract it off of waves moving away and lower the frequency of your light. So, uh-huh. Yeah, so you send in light that's like, you know, a terahertz and you reflect it off of this wave that's moving at 500 megahertz and now it's a terahertz plus 500 megahertz. You can make little shifts to the frequency. Mm -hmm. They're cool devices and they, they're used all over the place. They use them in laser printers. They use them in laser printers to you know, turn light on and off. You can use them. If you if you make the, the grading thin enough that you can sort of meet the Bragg condition at different angles by changing the frequency, you can change the direction of the beam. And you can do it really fast. So like if you go to a laser light show or something, that's usually what they use as AOMs to deflect things really fast. They're faster than, you know, Galvos or servo motors. Any other questions? There are so many cool instruments that you play with when you play with lasers. <laughs> a lot of cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. Lasers are fun. They are. But don't look into laser with remaining eye. Right? <laughs> Use your eye protection. Any other questions? Especially those that bring a green one. Oh yeah. Especially those little green handheld lasers, right? They're they're more powerful than you think. Yeah. The when you buy laser pointers online, they don't generally meet the like OSHA regulations or whatever, whatever the regulations are because they don't have to because nobody's checking them. And it turns out, you know, the little ultra, the little violet lasers. So to be a laser pointer, laser pointer, it's supposed to be less than five milliwatts, but the little violet lasers, they're technically ultraviolet. They're just outside of the visible range. So if they were really five milliwatts, they'd be so dim that everyone would send them back. So they make them more like hundred milliwatts. So 100 milliwatts of light just getting into the ionization kind of threshold, they're more dangerous than, you don't play with your cat with a purple laser pointer. And the green the ones, red ones, the, red. the green ones, green is easy to see, but it turns out they make them by doing, using nonlinear linear optics, frequency doubling, and it turns out that's more stable at higher powers. So most of the little green lasers that I've bought that are supposed to be less than five milliwatts, they put about 50 milliwatts of green out, plus an additional about 50 milliwatts of infrared. And you get the glasses that they sell, you know, on eBay or Amazon, the red laser glasses, they don't block the infrared. So half the light's still there, but now you can't see it. So yeah, if you're gonna play with your cat, 
definitely use a red laser pointer. Yeah. It probably really is only five milliwatts. It probably <laughs> is. Yes, yeah, Can you talk about some of the commercial applications of IPC and yeah. where this technology is going? That's a, a really good question. So we're doing it with lasers, optical stuff. And you could imagine, for example, you want to have a really high resolution microscope, but you don't want to pay for a high resolution lens. Maybe you could have an IPSI setup. So maybe someday we could make something which is inexpensive, but you could use, you know, like if you have some, you know, a hospital in a third world country that can't afford an expensive optical microscope, they could use this one. Or maybe something you couldn't quite do with optical microscopy, we get a factor of two in resolution. And so could you know, boost things there. In fact, there's a commercial product that's sort of related to this. With so it's a really expensive microscope, and then use interference to get that extra factor of two on top. But we can do it without the expensive microscope added to it. Um, some of the most interesting applications are: what if we take this technology and move away from visible light, like X-ray imaging? Um, the hardest part with X-ray imaging is making your lens. Making well, here we don't need lenses, right? So we just use mirrors. Um, with very reasonable calculations, we should be able to get like subatomic level. The hard part is, Ipsy takes time, and is your sample or your mirror going to move by an atom in that time? So, yeah. But if we can, if we can, if we can deal with that, we can get really good images with X-rays, acoustic imaging, um, radar. I think is a really uh, good one we could use. So the idea is. Um, instead of having to, you know, you do radio, radio astronomy, right? You've got this big dish, right? And you have to have a really big dish to get high resolution. Well, what if you're looking at something close where you can make your own, instead of waiting for radio waves to come to you, what if you send out radio waves and watch them bounce back, like with radar? Well, if you had a series of radar towers, so you could send radio waves in from different angles, you could get really high resolution imaging in one dimension without having to have a really big dish. So for example, you know, you get a return on your radar and you say that's either a bird or a stealth fighter. If you can resolve the size of it, you know whether it's really a bird or a stealth fighter. So um, I've had some people talk to me about using ground, using this for ground penetrating radar. It's uh, if you're familiar with anyone familiar with synthetic aperture radar, it's actually kind of closely related to synthetic aperture, um, but different. <laughs> so I think there's probably some good uh, options to use this with radar to improve the resolving power of radar. So you could use it for like maybe geological exploration? Yeah, uh-huh. Find like oil deposits or mineral yeah. deposits? Lost cities of Atlantis and stuff like that, <laughs> you know, whatever. Oh, actually acoustic imaging. Um, I know some people at BYU who do like acoustic, underwater acoustics. Once you get down in the ocean, optical transmission is very bad, but acoustic Ipsy imaging might be a way to like image the ocean floor. You know, that's another possibility. Like whales have been doing it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. But the problem with the whale is it's a small, it's a small emitter and a small detector, right? Or the bat, you know, it emits and sees things. Well, what if you had an array of bats that were emitting coherent sounds, then it's like, you know, imaging a bat imaging with a lens, an acoustic lens, you know, that's this big. We could do something similar, right? Acoustic way, coherent acoustic waves are really easy to make, right? Just a synthesizer, you know, a little function generator and speakers. And what if you had a bunch of speakers put on poles that were, you know, spread out over a distance and you could turn on different speakers and get your different interference patterns and potentially make high resolution images underwater. Except for that, it noise the neighbors. Ah, yes. The, <laughs> we did do some preliminary work with acoustic imaging, and we started with audio frequencies you can hear. They didn't have long wavelengths, so you need to have big things and speakers separated by a large amount. So we went out to a park, thought this will be fun, and turn on our speakers, and they're going, making these different frequencies to make the different interference patterns. And someone thought it was a car alarm, and so then the police showed up. <laughs> and then one of the neighbors came, and her, she was all mad because it was giving her husband headaches. And then um, memory went and spoke with the husband and explained the science we're doing. He's like, oh, this is cool. Well, if it's for science. And then you can see the wife. She's like, I just was like yelling at these people for you, and now you're OK with it. <laughs> but so I think the way to go with that is uh, 
ultrasound <laughs> so that people don't hear it. Also, with ultrasonic waves, they're shorter wavelengths, so we don't have to go out to a park. We could maybe do a desktop experiment with an acoustic, like acoustic isolating enclosure or something where we don't annoy the neighbors. Or the dogs. <laughs> or the dogs. Yeah, the dogs love that experiment, I'm sure. So if you remember Brian Patch's talk from last semester, it was similar. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, it's just a great experiment to get really familiar with Fourier transforms and reciprocal space, which then will help you with everything you do in science and life. And in, they're just really handy. And it's an emerging technology that has a lot of future applications. Yeah. So anyway, and it's just fun. We have pretty colored laser beams and cool devices and robots. And yeah, so <laughs> we have fun. Build a lot of our own electronics and things. So yeah, you get a, you get to do a little bit. Come in tomorrow, give me a line that scoots So yeah. Uh, Experimental physics is fun because you get to see a little bit of all kinds of things and you know you learn how to do plumbing, you'll learn how to do electronics, electricity, soldering, soldering. you'll be able to fix everything in your house. Program. Um, yeah, you do, you do programming, we do. And, and then there's also the like the theory stuff we have to do to figure out how everything works. So it's a lot of fun. I like being an experimentalist. Experimentalists work harder for each publication though because you have to do all of that stuff but and hopefully your department chair appreciates that <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>